first of all, I want to acknowledge right off the bat that climate change can really seem like an overwhelming issue. I think most people would probably agree about that. And I do want to note that Framingham has been really making some great strides more recently with energy conservation and sustainability. There's a sustainability coordinator here in our city. I sometimes I forget and keep calling it a town. I know we're a city now. But um, there are a lot of different efforts, and we're going to get more to energize Framingham at the end. But I want to acknowledge that people in the city and people involved in the city um, are making strides. But as I like to say, we can always do better. We can always do better about so many things, but definitely better with climate change. So let's get on to some recent statistics. I know statistics sound boring sometimes, but it's really important to understand where are we now and where were we in the past and where have we been in recent times? So first I need to start with the basics. Weather is what we see today. Climate covers long-term trends. So that can be very confusing for many people. So first of all, 19 of the 20 warmest years have all occurred in the last two decades. 2020 was the warmest year ever recorded. <laughs> so 2016 was the second highest, 2019 the third highest. So we want to definitely think about how this trend has been continuing a rising increase of temperatures dating back to 1860. 10 of the last 10 years have been the hottest on record. 10 of the last 10. So that makes you think a little bit about how this is affecting us. Um, some of the places um, around the world have been um, very hot here in the US, but also elsewhere. We're going to get to some different examples along the way. So we're going to break this down. This is a great website, the Sightline Institute. They have a really great graphic. Sometimes these numbers are very overwhelming. So when we look at, at climate science, if we break it down into different portions, it can sometimes help us understand it better. So we're going to talk about heat trapping blanket, regular versus rampant carbon dioxide, the ocean, and osteoporosis of the sea bit by bit. So we're going to start off with greenhouse gases and this blanket effect. So a heat trapping blanket, think about literally what that does. We put a blanket on ourselves in the winter, it traps the heat from our body, it keeps us warmer. So how does that actually happen? So some greenhouse gases already occur naturally in nature. They're just part of the whole cycle of the planet, but others will increase or result from human activities. So naturally occurring greenhouse gases include things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, even naturally occurring methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. So those are always present in some numbers here. Certain activities can also add to this level of these natural occurring gases. And some of those activities are definitely from human impacted things. For example, nitrous oxide is emitted during agricultural or industrial activities, as well as combustion of solid waste and fossil fuels. We're going to talk more about methane in a little bit, and also um, HFCs we're going to be talking about as well. So a lot of these different chemicals are emitted from industrial processes and are not naturally occurring. Hex uh, sulfur hexafluoride is one and perfluorocarbons is another. So there are chemicals basically that are natural, put out there from human activity, even though they are natural, we're putting more of them out there and some that are just made by human activity. So how are we affecting the climate? It's really a lot of things together, all coming together. Now, reductions in carbon dioxide definitely take us down um, a, sort of a better path, less destructive path, and this is really our only chance to be making a difference here. Every day, we're seeing more and more of an increase and sometimes very, very large increases. We'll get to some of these ways that even in our own homes, we might literally have um, things that could substantially increase um, greenhouse gases without even realizing it. So let's look at one thing you might not be aware of. So, this is literally one of the things that's increasing a lot of methane into the environment. So natural gas has definitely been touted as a greener fuel. You've probably all heard that, but it does have some challenges. Um, emissions result from leaks and routine venting during production, processing and transportation, 
and other things. There's a lot of leakage going on out there. Now I look at this and I say, there's a big waste. If we're just letting methane or natural gas just go willy nilly into the sky, that is natural gas someone could be using to heat their home, right? So if it's just being let go, that's a big challenge. Also, methane is a much more potent natural gas than carbon dioxide. When people talk about lots of carbon dioxide in the air, that's not the same as greenhouse gases. That is only one of many greenhouse gases out there. There are some efforts to try to capture this. And in fact, I have a little map here. Um, there are also um, some efforts to uh, capture it and control it, but they're not all being taken. So you can see these issues are actually from around the world. You first have to find it in order to be able to fix it. So an energy consulting company actually did this. This was published by um, Reuters. And they found that one leak, just one, was spewing out 93 tons of methane every hour, the daily amount equivalent to 15,000 cars in the United States. You think about that, it's like, wow, that's, that's a lot coming out of there. So a lot of companies, like I said, are starting to use space age technology, literally <laughs> satellites, to find where the biggest methane leaks are in order to try to stop them. Um, this same company found a second leak nearby was gushing at the rate of 17 tons an hour. So that's really overwhelming that there is this much wasting going on. But it's really important that companies are held responsible for it. So if we don't have some rules and regulations that if we find this, that, they're, that they need to fix it, they're not going to, it's expensive. It's wasting their product, but it's more expensive sometimes for them to go through and fix it in the short term, probably not in the long term. So let's look at another thing that has a big impact on our pockets. Yep, this is the final $2020 billion, yes, that's billion with a B, weather and climate disasters information. So this is officially confirming what communities across the nation experienced firsthand. And it was a historic year of extremes. We're gonna to get to the detail here, but this sort of gives you a, a, a little bit of a, an overview as to what we saw. So this is showing an increase of number of billion dollar events each year. Yep, that's 2020. So it has the most billion dollar events of any year so far. Now costs each year, no matter the year, you can see the trend is going up, but pay attention to 2005 here. We're gonna get back to that in a minute, but that's an important year to remember as well. So here it kind of splits out. This is a little bit of where in the world we're seeing, where in the United States, we're seeing certain impacts. Not everybody's having the same climate change impact. So we're still having a little bit effect from drought and heat wave, but nothing compared to the South and the West for sure. Of course, cyclones or hurricanes, you're not gonna get them in Minnesota, for example, but we certainly get them in the South and all the way up through the Northeast. So thinking about what places are impacted by wildflower fires and other things might, um, if we look at it as a whole, that's a really big impact to our country, even though we might not have the same effect that other people are having elsewhere. So first of all, in 2020 was only the second time the Greek alphabet was actually used to name storms. First time was in 2005 again. Remember that line? 2005 was Hurricane Katrina. And we all know what a huge impact that one had. So we're definitely seeing disasters of all kinds increasing. In the last five years, the total cost of US in billions was 600 plus billion dollars. So if you hear all these numbers coming around with COVID and fighting COVID and all this, this is actually a bigger trend in money in the, the shorter, middle, and longer term than COVID will ever cost us if we don't do something now. The five-year annual cost average was $120 billion a year. This is ongoing, only to be looking to get worse. Last 10 years, $890 billion. Last 15 years, over $1 trillion with 173 events. Think about that. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? These are all uh, 
um, this is all information from NOAA. So it really is a, a big deal that we're seeing this impact. And if, you, if you're uh, familiar with insurance companies, they're doing the data analysis right now. It's costing them, which means it's also costing us. Guess whose insurance rates are going up for homeowners insurance or other kinds of insurance because of disasters found throughout the country. So here is just one example. Um, this is actually a photo that a friend of mine took um, while he was up flying in a plane, uh, a friend of mine in Kentucky, uh, results of an EF4 tornado, sorry, tornado, not a hurricane, um, that literally traveled through. So we're seeing hurricanes and tornadoes increasing around the United States. So definitely severe weather is on the rise. So extreme weather in Massachusetts. I grew up around here. I don't ever remember hearing about tornadoes. And, um, and actually, um, th I have to say, I, I erred in, in correcting one thing, but the, um, in Connecticut, those tornadoes were actually last, last year. So two dozen tornadoes in just 2018. So there are major changes happening right in our area close to home. So tornadoes in Massachusetts are more common when tropical air masses work up from the south. That often happens in association with warm fronts. So we're having more and more of those coming along. So what other changes are we seeing? We're definitely getting more extreme weather, but again, different than other places. We're getting too much or not enough water, more hot days in summer, more dry days. So severe winter storms have actually more than doubled over the last 55 years relative to the previous 60. So we're having an increase in winter storms and severity as well, and also changes in snowfall versus rainfall. And in many cases, we've been seeing later wetter springs. This spring so far seems to be a little bit different, but think about the last few years. We had spring very, very late and a lot of bigger snowstorms in March in the past, say, five years or so. So remember, one storm is weather. Multiple storms over time is climate change. So you can't just say one storm is climate change, it's the trend over time. So we're definitely also seeing issues with nor'easters becoming more intense and occurring more often. So that's definitely um, something that we are seeing here. So no question, we're seeing more frequency and intensity of extreme precipitation events. We're seeing more flooding. Uh, think Route 9. <laughs> we all know there's challenges on Route 9 with flooding. There are certainly times, even on Speen Street, where I believe it or not, I had to turn around. But this is definitely something that we're seeing that we're going to have to resolve here in our city. Now, of course, flooding events have risen in association with increases in precipitation, but also with snows melting more quickly as well. So definitely increases one way or the other. Now, when we think desert and drought, we usually don't think around around here, right? We think out west, mm, Texas, maybe Arizona. But this is not how it's always been out there. In the southwestern US, the habitat has changed dramatically from grass and shrubland in the 1800s now to desert. This is a change that's happened literally in the last 150 years out there. There are many factors for this change, including climate change, overuse of water resources and overgrazing of livestock. That has all exacerbated the problem. So we all know the 2019 Western wildfire season was the most expensive ever, over $80 billion in Western wildfires. Again, insurance companies are a little bit worried about this and I certainly don't blame them. The total um, $142 billion estimate in the cost of climate um, extremes uh, that year includes that number. But these are not simply caused by climate change. It is more complicated. So definitely uh, 2020 already had more than 2019. These numbers are increasing and increasing and increasing. So you can just imagine that climate change and drought is one way this is being impacted. But you're saying, that's California, that's out there. That's not affecting us here, right? Well, let's look at Oregon and Washington and all the fires that they had more recently out there. There are many cascade effects, including 
many from climate change that have added to that catastrophic fire level in the West. Selective logging in certain areas has let, led to less tree biodiversity, and in some places, invasive grasses have increased the chance of damaging fires. But with warmer winters, insects like bark beetles that would normally not kill trees can reproduce faster and increase in number and kill more trees. So more dead trees, also more people living in fire prone areas mean more fighting of fires and more things that can be burned. So of course you might uh, remember that in many cases, people were fighting fires for years and years and years. So some of the natural fires that would have cleared out some of the brush and a few of the dead trees uh, were prevented from happening too. It's really all sorts of different things combined. So while we may not have realized that effects of climate change in another part of the country affect us, do you remember the smoke? Do you remember what we saw as a result of the fires out west? 2020 really made it clear. The smoke in Portland, Oregon made it all the way to Massachusetts, 3,000 miles. Think about that for a minute. It did the same thing across Canada as well. Add that to the increase in temperatures and dryness due to climate change, and you've got a whole lot of fires affecting the entire nation. So this was literally Portland, Oregon. It does not normally look like this in the summertime. For five consecutive days, starting in September, they saw a huge increase of emergency room visits for asthma-like symptoms because of this smoke. This smoke led to the worst air quality ever recorded. So this just shows you the impact of what fires can do that affect our health as well. So, but it's affecting other places around the world. I have friends in Australia and in South Africa. You might have heard about the droughts there. Australia was sweltering through its hottest spring in November on record last year. So they had astronomically high temperatures in 2020, but before that, 2019 was their hottest and driest year on record. So if you think about that, the extremes are getting worse and worse. So on December 18th, 2019, the most extreme of all of those days, the average, the average daytime maximum across Australia was 107.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that, that's pretty hot. So in South Africa, they've been having some severe challenges in the past number of years. A few years ago, a friend of mine was telling me he lives in Cape Town, South Africa, and he was telling me that they didn't have enough water to um, take showers. They were only allowed to take a two minute shower once a week. They had to use dishwater to flush their toilets. And uh, basically they were almost on empty. The entire city was almost on empty. This is basically what it looked like. Dry cracked earth and that was it. Can you imagine if in the Boston area, you turned on the tap and nothing came out. This has already happened in places around the world and South Africa is one of them. Fortunately, they have had some um, rains since then, but they had extreme water rationing where only the wealthy, only the wealthiest could actually be guaranteed water. In fact, many very wealthy people were filling up their uh, swimming pools, making sure everything was filled up because they might've had to drink their swimming pool water. It was that bad. Literally, the city had only days of water left. So are we seeing that here in the US? Believe it or not, we are. Areas of Arizona and California are already experiencing extreme loss of groundwater. They have some water because they've been pumping it from aquifers under the ground. This has dropped the height of the land. The actual land has dropped sometimes even a matter of feet. Think about that if your house actually dropped two feet down. Probably not so good on your house, right? In Death Valley, California actually hit an astonishing almost 130 degrees Fahrenheit, 129.9 degrees Fahrenheit on Sunday, August 16th, 2020. They rounded it to 130 in the final report from NOAA. That is outrageously hot. Let's get back here to Massachusetts. We are currently in a drought across Massachusetts. This is a good example of how in um, September 2020, we were in a drought. We started to come out of it, but I want you to think about what we've been hearing about on the news recently. 
Did you hear about it on the news? We've had issues here in Massachusetts with chances of brush fires just in the last week. Parts of Massachusetts, this is dated March 18th. This is the most recent report available. We already have areas that are abnormally dry. And this was literally right on WBZ-TV. We've already had red flag warnings issued in Massachusetts for critical fire conditions. And this is supposed to be one of our wettest months of the year. Yep, 2021, number four from this year in the first part of March. So this is already happening in some parts of Massachusetts. Now we do hope we'll get rain that will sort of dig us out of this, but the estimate, estimate over time is that Boston may experience 33 days per year that exceed 100 degrees by 2100. I don't know about you, I don't enjoy 100 degree days. I don't enjoy 95 degree days. I certainly wouldn't wanna see over a month in an entire year of temperatures that high. Without a, with a greater risk of heat waves and hot nights without cooling, there'll be more hospitalizations and more related illnesses. They're already seeing that in the Southwest. So how will this affect wildlife? Let's get down to what will it actually do here. Here's an example of a vernal pool drying up early. As vernal pools dry up too fast, egg masses and tadpoles may not survive. In fact, today I just heard wood frogs. This is a wood frog tadpole. In order for these animals to be able to survive, they are adapted to an area that will dry up, but not that quickly. Vernal pools are often seasonal and don't last for the entire year. But in the past few decades, severe and prolonged episodes of drought are becoming commonplace throughout North America. We're seeing impacts on tadpoles and frogs that provide food for many other species. And think about amphibians, they also provide important insect control as well. I'm part of a field research study group from the Copperhead Institute, and they found that during drought, copperhead snakes in Connecticut actually have fewer babies. How many other species might be affected this way, leading to decline of multiple species? If animals like the copperhead depend on frogs and toads that require water to multiply, hmm, what will that do to their numbers in the long term? So warmer winters. I don't know how many of you ski or snowshoe, but we're definitely seeing changes over time. This is actually a pretty good year for skiing, but there hasn't really been the same regular snow for skiing and snowshoeing in the last, say, 15 years that there used to be. When I was working at Broadmoor, I used to leave my skis in my office every winter, but not in the more recent years. This past year was almost like the old days. So some of you may also remember the blizzard of 78. Yep, that's me in my little snowsuit. They never came to plow our, plow our road in Newton. I was literally skiing down the street. My dad and two friends actually had to snow blow the street days later. Yep, they never came ever came to plow our street. That's how much snow there was out there. So think about it. When was the last time you were actually snowed in like that? Even though we've had bigger snowstorms, the plows always came eventually. So thinking about how warmer winters are also affecting our trees, a life without maple syrup, I don't know about you, but I would absolutely be horrified to have a life without maple syrup or maple sugar candy too. But that is definitely going to be impacting um, us over time because we are actually at the southern range of the sugar maple tree. Climate change is causing slower growth and may cause the absolute loss of this species of tree here in Massachusetts. Most temperate species, including sugar maples, have a chilling requirement. They've got to go through a cold period in order to actually get that sap flowing. They actually have to have a certain number of cold days as well. So cold winter days are really required, sometimes even for buds of some species to break dormancy too. So it depends on the species as to how much cold they need, but this is definitely something that affects sugar maples. How is it gonna change our forests though? We're already seeing a shifting and loss of species. So you can see this graph over time from the US Forest Service showing that 
going from more of a pine type forest to an oak type forest, and then a short or long leaf pine over time. This is a change that's gonna be happening over the next number of years. So we're gonna see this shifting occurring, but think about how this might also affect bird species that require these habitats as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of poison ivy. Are you? I doubt it. Are you aware that poison ivy is being affected by climate change right now? There are unintended consequences for sure. Right now we're seeing more poison ivy plants and stronger chemical coming from them. I know quite a few people who've told me, I never used to be allergic to poison ivy, but now I'm getting reactions all the time. Well, this has actually been proven by science and by studies that have been done. If you increase in the lab the volume of poison ivy or volume of CO2 that poison ivy is exposed to, you can see that the uricial, that's the chemical that makes us itch, the concentration is stronger and stronger and stronger. Think of it like an analogy of our uh, laundry detergent, where you might just use a teeny bit now or a pod where you used to have to use two cups of laundry detergent or a much larger volume. That's what's happening to that chemical that makes us itch. I don't know about you, but uh, that's not a good thing for me or a lot of other people out there. Poison ivy loves carbon dioxide. Now we're seeing impacts on other species of animal. Now, I hope you're not too freaked out by seeing a snake here. These are really important animals out there in nature. But more recently, we've been seeing temperatures even in the mid 60s in the middle of winter. This can cause animals like snakes to emerge too quickly from hibernation. Now, garter snakes are a little bit cold tolerant and can handle it sometimes, not so much with the water snake. I have seen these animals actually frozen um, after a warm spell where they came out thinking, oh, it's spring, and then getting caught outside for too long. So how is this affecting other animals too? Changing seasons around the world. We're seeing in the Netherlands, the change in caterpillar hatching times is affecting migratory birds. In Alaska and British Columbia, over 14 million acres of spruce trees have been killed by bark beetles. Think about that, how that led to an increase in fires. And fewer cold days here has definitely allowed the spread of pine beetles. So let's look at how a change in climate affects them through other things. How about shifting precipitation types, total precipitation, intensity of events, all things causing changes in forest quality, understory, insect numbers, and even fire patterns. Milkweed flowering right now is out of sync with our arriving monarchs. Things are changing too fast for many to adjust. While there have been changes in the Earth's past, they were over thousands and tens of thousands and even millions of years, not literally tens of years. Inland flooding. This photo was taken right in Framingham. If this came as snow, it would take much longer to melt and the flow would be much more spread out. So a lot of you have probably heard loons. They are present in the state, maybe not in our little part of the state, but loon nests are very susceptible to irregular storms with the rise and fall of lakes in warmer weather where they are nesting. How about in our little neck of the woods? This affects our local red-winged blackbirds. Their nests are also built close to the surface and their babies are also at risk from the heat, the storms, and the rise of water. If they're not strong enough to climb up as the water rises, they will literally drown. Either the eggs will drown or the babies will drown in the nest. So this will literally impact animals that we might love to hear. So how about something you might not have noticed, especially if you haven't lived in this part of the country all that long? Warmer weather is bringing new species north. Hmm, do you recognize this red-bellied woodpecker? This bird has only become common in Massachusetts during the past two decades. A lot of people don't realize this. So this is definitely a change that's been occurring over time. In fact, I've got a little, little graph here where you can see over time the changes in where birds are found. Everybody's moving north. So how does it affect other wildlife with later and wetter springs? So shifting temperature patterns are actually changing when certain insects emerge and even their numbers. So dragonflies, 
in 2018, the spring warming was so late, dragonflies were over five weeks late, causing mosquitoes to be out without predators for a longer period of time. Yep, if you're not into mosquitoes, you've got to love our dragonflies. They're great mosquito predators. But with those cold, wet springs, it takes them longer to finish maturing and to come out. They're much larger animals, whereas a mosquito can actually mature much more quickly. How about our cute little tree swallows? You may have seen them around as well. They're long distance migrants that breed in New England, but their numbers have declined much faster than many resident species of birds. Part of the reason may be that these migratory species cannot adjust their migration schedules enough to coincide with the shifting peak abundance of their faraway food sources. They're gonna leave when they leave. So it may lead to problems with food availability for not only the adults, but also the juveniles. In some cases, they've actually been laying eggs a little bit later, but in recent years, we've actually had adults starving due to not enough food sources out for them. They've definitely been eating mosquitoes though, so they have been helping us in that area. So yellow warblers are another good example of an animal that's been seriously impacted. So what are we seeing in terms of plants too? Trees and flowers are shifting when they're emerging. Trees and shrubs actually respond to air temperatures, not soil temperatures. This will affect flowering and leaf emergence, and that can also affect fruiting times as well. Now they will vary tree to tree and shrub to shrub, depending on where they're located, and even within species. So Richard Premack, uh, he's actually a researcher from Boston University. He wrote a fantastic book called Walden Warming. And if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend it. Not only uh, is it a, a great book, but it has fascinating information. For example, he's finding that all individuals of a given species will leaf out later during a cold spring than during a warm spring. Over time, he's been able to see um, individuals in a warm location coming out earlier, indiv individuals in a northern facing hill coming out later, so southern versus northern. But you're seeing different species coming out at different times than they used to in the past. There's a trend over time. If you have allergies, you may have noticed the growing season in Massachusetts is approximately 10 days longer than it was before 1960. And speaking as someone with allergies, I've definitely been noticing that, especially ragweed pollen season increasing. So we're definitely seeing forests being altered. The early leaf out days are actually expected to continue in the coming decades across a lot of North America, but we're seeing differences again between trees, shrubs, and flowers. So because there's a wide variation, we need to look at trends too. So here's an example, forsythia. Do any of you have forsythia in your yard? You might have noticed this is an early flowering shrub. This is responding to air temperatures. So in Eastern Massachusetts, these species leaf out over a four to six week period. So you'll definitely see some variation. Again, your yard might be different than my yard, but look at other yards that are similar to yours in your neighborhood. Are you still seeing them come out early? Now, this also will affect food sources for wildlife like insects. So if the insects aren't out when the flowers are flowering, that can make a big difference for pollination. So emerging plants respond to ground temperatures. So this would be black-eyed Susans, for instance, and other flowers. They've been increasingly late in the past 10 years. So columbine's another good example of a flower that's coming out later. Who depends on columbine? Yep, hummingbirds. Remember, if the animals are coming back earlier with earlier air temperatures, the food they need for survival may not be out in time for them when they arrive here. Another example that Richard Premack found is forest wildflowers. Usually they would have a little bit of a head start on those trees leafing out, just enough time for them to pop out. But as the trees are emerging earlier and the wildflowers are emerging later, they're getting less and less of that sunny head start. So this will definitely make changes over time to the different species we see in the forest. Do any of you have a garden? 
you might have seen more fungus in recent years in your tomatoes. We've even seen more fungal diseases coming up in animals like snakes. Now, of course, this is not the same every year. It does depend on the conditions that year, but we are seeing trends over time. Now, sea level rise. Let's get to other things that are affecting us. Warming water causes land and sea ice to melt and seawater to expand. So warming water alone will cause expansion and sea level rise. So overall, we're seeing a lot of meltwater going in from examples like these glaciers. And um, this is a good example of when I was in Alaska a number of years ago in 2009, it was 75 degrees in August on land. In more recent years, it's even gotten up into the 80s and even 90s in the Arctic. That never used to happen. So here's an example just showing temperatures in Alaska increasing and snowpacks going down. Now you're saying, we're not in Alaska. How is that affecting us? Yep, this is downtown Boston, right near the aquarium. That's Christopher Columbus Park. We've already had severe flooding in downtown Boston that has affected people, businesses, and public transportation. Do you remember hearing on the news about a waterfall going down the stairs at Aquarium Tea Station? Yes, indeed, that actually happened more than one year in a row. It's also going to be affecting other towns along the coast, such as in places like Situate. More and more flooding. Since 1922, the sea levels in Boston Harbor have rid risen by 10.4 inches. Think about how much that will affect us with storms. Now, Again, they're also rising faster here in New England than elsewhere along the planet because warming water takes up more space and there's now more of it. The other reason why we have flooding is also a lot of Boston was built on fill and there is some subsidence as well happening. This is one of the estimates for a future map of Boston. This would affect the city a lot. So let's get to one of the ways that we will directly be affected here in Framingham. There are other effects from the ocean. Not only is fresh water coming in and leading to sea level rise, but if warmer water starts, stops moving off our coast, that's one thing that actually keeps us warmer in the winter than places like North Dakota. I don't know about you, I don't wanna be living in a North Dakota winter, but warming ocean circulation keeps those somewhat warming waters off our coast. It's definitely warmer than it could otherwise be. So the circulatory system of the ocean is affected by extra fresh water coming in and changes in the water coming in from glaciers. So definitely coastal flooding is predicted to increase and this is going to affect wildlife like coastal nesting birds like the semi-palmated plover. No question, these are some of the birds that are most threatened, not only by rising seas leading to habitat loss, but also literally to um, having any places to nest. So another animal, our adorable little puffins off of our coast. It's affecting food sources for puffins and whales and other species because a lot of our food off the coast is moving. Fish are moving in accordance to temperature. The animals that prey on them need to move as well. And this can lead to a lot of threats to animals like puffins that do need a nesting space. Now, while loggerhead turtles don't nest here, we do have these turtles visit us in the warmer months. Eventually, of course, where they do nest, um, sometimes in the Caribbean and elsewhere in Central America, or even at some species in Florida, eventually, of course, baby turtles come out. We love to see turtles, right? But the sex of the turtle is determined by the temperature of the egg. The warmer the temperature, the more females. Nests are also, of course, affected by sea level rise. Again, fewer beaches for nesting, not unlike the birds. So thinking about now and in the future, we're looking at habitat loss, more species moving, and more species loss. Even our state bird. Yep, the black-capped chickadee is at risk of leaving the state and moving north. That would be really sad to lose our state bird. We're going to talk about one more thing, osteo osteoporosis of the sea, climate change, and a definite breakdown. Hmm. So, when we think of osteoporosis, we think of losing calcium, right? That's out of our bodies, but it's also being, um, it's affecting coral reefs and other things in the ocean. More carbon dioxide means ocean acidification and disruption of marine food chains. 
This is what it looks like when coral bleaches. And ocean acidification is one thing, as well as warmer waters, that can lead to coral bleaching. Coral reefs are key habitats for fish that feed millions and millions of people throughout the world. And here too, this is one of the reasons why marine protected areas, such as off our coast, are so important. Remove as many of the other stressors as possible. So that will hopefully help some of these places to survive. Other stressors include fishing, boat and gear damage, and chemicals such as sunscreens and pesticides. So when we think of corals, we definitely don't think here in the Northeast, but we've got corals here. We also have other animals that you might not be thinking of that could be affected by warming temperatures. Do you like lobster? I saw a lot of people were talking about seafood. Our local marine life has been affected, such as shell disease in lobsters. These lobsters are moving north. Our lobsters may actually end up leaving the United States. So much for Massachusetts and Maine lobster. We're gonna be talking Nova Scotia lobster. That seems very strange to think of here in New England. What about animals that use calcium to build their shells? Normally they take calcium out of the water. What would they do? Well, how many of you like chowder? I guess I have to use a little New England uh, slang on that one. But think about how many people eat clam chowder. Clams require uh, the calcium to be brought out of the ocean. With ocean acidification, they will eventually have a harder and harder time building their shells. This also applies to oysters. So this is a really, really big change. And of course, clams and oysters are also really important parts of the food chain. They're filter feeders and also provide a lot of food for wildlife as well. So warming waters also lead to disruption of food chains, diseases affecting sea stars. There's a wasting disease in the Atlantic and also in the Pacific that has led to decline of sea stars. This has also affected um, how many urchins there are. So sea stars, urchins, and clams all get out of whack, leading to a disruption again of food chains. When one is affected, they're all affected due to their relationship. So what can we do? So some things people are considering now are electric cars. There are a lot of different places where people can plug in. Um, you might even be able to get a fuel efficient car as well. There are a lot of Priuses around this area. So even if people don't have an electric car, they might have a more fuel efficient hybrid. Have you noticed the price of gas going up? Hmm. In my Toyota Prius, I was even getting up to a maximum of 80 miles per gallon. And that was just a hybrid. So great way to conserve energy at home. Drive less, bike more. A lot of us have been doing this during COVID for sure. A great way to get out and about and still stay socially distanced, walking or biking. How about if you have southern siding, maybe put solar panels on your house. Now we know not everybody can do that, but there are sometimes opportunities for people to get good deals on installing solar panels on their home. Some people can even charge their, their cars at home. How about energy efficient heat pump systems? There are actually discounts for getting these systems, including interest-free loans. I did that at my house. So between heating efficiency and solar panels, my entire bill for last year, and my entire house is electric, my entire bill was $60. I have no gas, I have no oil, I have only electric. Wow, that's pretty good, huh? It saves money over time as well by being efficient. Now I have to say I did also have extra insulation put up in the attic and my AC was only on for about three hours last summer. The insulation in the attic actually meant I needed to cool the house less. I also used natural solar heating. On sunny days, like today, I just had all the drapes open. Yep, my heat didn't come on at all. Or you could even probably have opened the windows and heat your house a little bit on warmer days in the spring. And in the summertime, I make sure the drapes stay closed to keep the heat in, uh, or keep the, the, the heat out and the cool in. So you can just change it depending on the season. Now there are other options to move heat and help with cooling, fans and even LED lights. You probably know a lot about that, but to make sure that they're all changed um, makes a really big difference. Also, the compact fluorescent bulbs do have mercury in them where LEDs do not. Are you saving water too? Remember, we're in drought. You can put an energy efficient and also water efficient 
shower head in. Because remember, if you're not using as much hot water, you're also saving energy in addition to water. And who wants to save, uh, who wants to risk um, wasting resources, right? I even installed a little soap button. So I could literally shut off the water while I was doing a little shampooing. What else can you do? Do you have a garden? You can actually put in rain barrels and collect water from the roof in order to water your yard. So that might be when you plant a new plant or that might be to water some sort of vegetable garden. But in many places around the world, people already must do this where drinking water is scarce, such as low-lying tropical islands. They must do that. They can't choose to do it. It's a necessity. So saving water and using more natural products can also lead to cleaner water. Plants will also act as natural filters. So what are some other things you can do? You can eat less meat. Do a meatless Monday. So eating local as well. We have a lot of great resources around here. A lot of places where if you don't have room for a garden, you might be able to buy um, supplies locally. And also wasting less food. A lot of people realize that bananas can ripen pretty quickly over COVID. And I do believe a lot of banana bread was being made over this time. So composting. This is another great way to reduce waste. I actually only take my trash out about once a month. I really don't need to because I compost almost everything. I have very little actual trash that goes out. Think about that. Most of what I might have previously thrown out could be recycled or composted. So you can compost lots of things. It's literally like black gold, but there are some things that you can't compost. Things like fats and meats, not so much, but if you have a garden, those eggshells and coffee grounds are fantastic. You can even include cardboard egg boxes, scrunched up paper and fallen leaves. So really, really black gold. It lessens the need for chemical fertilizers, enriches the soil and reduces methane from landfills. All things helping. So learn more and act. Do what you're doing today. Reduce your use of plastics from fossil fuels. You can even bring reusable cloth bags for fruit and veggies to the store. This is a great example that I actually purchased from the Earthling company. What are some of the other things we can do? We can not only reuse, reduce, recycle, but repurpose too. Have you ever gotten a plastic box that you might be able to use for something else? I've even moved to shampoo bars rather than plastic bottles and I love my shampoo bars. If you're buying things online like on Amazon, you might be able to combine multiple things in the same shipment. What else can you do? This is something I learned just Sunday. On NPR's series, Living on Earth, they showcased a story about an environmental reporter of all things that thought he was doing the right thing. He was doing all of his due diligence, checking out the energy efficient ratings of the new refrigerator that he needed to buy. But he had no idea what he actually ended up with ended up a carbon bomb. What is that? Well, he even did his due diligence and asked. He asked the, at the store, he said, I want to make sure that this uses isobutane and not HFCs. But the one he ended up with actually did use HFCs and he did have to return it. He had to go through a whole process to even figure out what to do. What is HFC? It's 3,700 times worse for the climate than carbon dioxide. Now, this is what we went to to try to save the ozone layer. But while we're saving the ozone layer, we're actually, if this leaks, putting a lot more than carbon dioxide into the air. There are proper ways to dispose of this chemical and make sure that it doesn't get into the air and is captured, but you've got to take the step to do it. Do you have a carbon bomb in your house? I know I do. Like I said, I just learned about this on Sunday. So what else can you do to help wildlife reduce existing stressors, like keeping your cats indoors? By helping to reduce the existing stress, animals and plants will have an easier time adjusting. Each year, outdoor cats kill more than a billion birds in the United States and Canada. So it definitely helps our birds out there. Landscape your yard for wildlife. Gardens, trees, and native flowers are good for people and birds. And a lot of people have found gardening very therapeutic during COVID. Planting native plants also helps our native bees, dragonflies and butterflies by providing habitat. We depend on insect pollinators for our food too. What else can we do? 
eliminate use of chemicals that kill our beneficial insects, like bees, butterflies, and even dragonflies. One human-caused challenge is definitely overuse of herbicides and pesticides. Companies that claim to mosquito shield your property can't put a dome over your house. Instead, they spray expensive and harmful chemicals to kill those beneficial insects. And the mosquitoes can still come over from next door. Native predators like dragonflies are much more effective. You want to know how many mosquitoes I've had in my yard? I have yet to see a one since I moved in and planted my butterfly and dragonfly garden. Instead, I've had five different species of native dragonflies solving that problem for me for free. I don't know about you, but I definitely prefer free. You can also ask that your home not be sprayed for mosquitoes by the state. You can find it by Googling mosquito spray, Massachusetts opt out, and I'll also put a link in the chat in a minute. So what else can you do? Get involved, join and support local land trusts, advocate, um, advocate for CPA funds, support local and regional efforts, and of course, vote. But here's something that I've become involved in over COVID as well. Great local resources right here in Framingham. To get involved in Energize Framingham, you can visit the website and sign up. Literally, here's the, here's the website address here, energizeframingham.org is a quick link that'll take you right to the website. This site actually helps you to note what you're doing, what options you might have to do more, and you can even make a neighborhood team if you wanna have a little competition among your neighbors and see the impact your whole neighborhood might be able to make if everybody works together. Um, so Joy mentioned Energize Framingham and um, she and I have, and another colleague of ours have worked a lot on this website. Um, just wanted to give you an overview and hope you'll check it out. It's energizeframingham.org. And as Joy said, it has a lot of different actions that you can take everything from that black earth compost she was mentioning to buying a hybrid or electric vehicle. If you're interested in doing an action, each of these has information um, as to where to get it, how to do this, and also has reviews from other community members about vendors they might have used or their experience with certain actions like insulating their home through Mass Safe. Joey also mentioned the teams and um, Thanks to the Framingham High School Environmental Club who have provided us with, I believe, eight wonderful interns over the last year. Um, they started an environmental, um, they started an energized Framingham team just for the uh, High School Environmental Club, which has been wonderful. They can look then at their collective actions and carbon saved. Um, and the only other thing I would mention is that uh, with the Mass Save program that, um, I mentioned if you haven't had an audit, it's a great time to do it. An energy assessment to do insulation. They give you uh, very deep discounts on insulation and um, interest-free loans for any remaining cost for other things as well, like heat pumps. And Framingham, the city is now working with a, a nonprofit called All In Energy to act as a customer advocate for you during the Mass Save um, um, process. And you can visit their website at framinghamsaves.org. And it's, um, this is a special opportunity for Framingham is what I would say, having a customer advocate by your side. So that's all I have for tonight. Um, thank you.